And now it's my pleasure to introduce our moderator and guest speaker for the evening. First, our moderator this evening will be Dr. Michelle Larson, the president and CEO of Adler Planetarian, an accomplished astrophysicist with a passion for science education. Dr. Larson is the Adler's ninth leader. She oversees the institution's landmark museum complex, exhibition galleries, and three theaters, a robust research enterprise, and an award-winning education and outreach program. Now, Dr. Larson's personal passion is enabling engagement and communication between scientists and the public, and we've been having a lively conversation up here. And now, I would like to introduce our speaker for the evening, Dean Kamen of DECA. Mr. Kamen is an inventor, entrepreneur, and tireless advocate for science and technology. Now, as an inventor, he holds more than 440 U.S. and foreign patents, many for innovative medical devices that have expanded the frontiers of healthcare worldwide. In 1976, he founded his first medical device company, Auto Syringe Inc., to manufacture and market the wearable infusion pumps he had invented as a college undergraduate. At the age of 30, he sold the company and soon founded DECA Research and Development Corporation. Now, at DECA, he developed notable inventions that include an advanced prosthetic arm, the iBot mobility device, and the Segway human transporter. In addition to DECA, one of Mr. Kamen's proudest accomplishments is founding FIRST, an organization dedicated to motivating the next generation to understand, use, and enjoy science and technology. Founded in 1989, this year FIRST will serve more than 400,000 young people aged 6 to 18 in more than 80 countries around the world. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dean Kamen. So first, thank you. Second, as I typically do when I'm asked to stand in front of a large group of people, especially knowing so many of you might actually be paying attention, um, I'll set your expectations by saying I'm not a public speaker. And the only reason I'm ever willing to go stand in front of a bunch of people is enlightened self-interest. When I'm told there's gonna to be a lot of smart people that are influential that could help you build first, and I said, as long as whatever else you want me to talk about, we reserve an appropriate amount of time to talk about first, I'll stand there and make a jackass of myself for a while. <laughs> and we reached that agreement. So, but then they said, but you got to talk about some of your tech stuff. It's about innovation. People want to hear that. And I said, well, there's not a lot of time for that. And I said, I'll give a very high-level overview of that, and then we'll talk about first. But just at the reception upstairs, one by one, people said to me, how is the eye, how's your water project? A physician is among us. I understand you're working on your, your, your diabetes pump. And, and it turns out each of the things I was asked to talk about, somebody's asked about, so I, I guess you know your audience. I want to just, again, reiterate in a few minutes talking about four or five completely unrelated technologies. I'm not trying to do it in depth. I'll do it mostly for some, A, credibility, B, maybe there's some connection and some interest, but mostly it's, I hope, to set the stage for why Technology, I think, when properly applied, when used as a tool, not a weapon, uh, can really help change the world. And if there's anybody in this room tonight that doesn't think this world is in an accelerated need for change, you're numb or I need to take whatever it is you're eating. But, <laughs> but so, so again, and while I'm here, I have to say, I have a lot of connections to Chicago. It's, you know, I was originally a New Yorker. I now live in little New Hampshire, but the only two cities I've ever thought were the kind of intense places that, that I grew up in, New York. And then I'd visit most cities. Some were big, you know, I was in Mexico City last night, 27. But the two cities in, that just always seemed to me like, that's a city, 
not a town like Boston, not a village like, or Chicago and, and New York. And Illinois Institute of Technology, I'm now an alum. I got my degree there, a PhD efficiently, a five minute talk at a commencement. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, but it worked. And, uh, and I sold, I sold one of my first successful little companies to Baxter Healthcare out here and then continue to do, and still to this day, do a lot of work for them in advanced, for instance, uh, care devices for people with end-stage renal failure. So again, since I'm gonna quickly run out of time, I am gonna whisk through some things here. And about five years ago, I put together a three-minute video because I never knew where I'd be asked to speak next. And they, even here, they asked me, can you bring some product that you made, you know, the arm? You have to talk about the arm. Well, I can't bring the arm, and I can't bring a person missing both of his own arms, and it's, and, and can you bring an iBot? But over the years, five times I visited a show, which at the time, and even more so today, is the only credible news source in America, Stephen Colbert. <laughs> and, uh, and each time he'd call me, I'd go down there, but I'd say, Stephen, sure, as I just said to you, I've got nothing better to do than let a world-class comic make a complete jackass of me um, on national television. But as long as we reserve just a sentence or two to talk about first, you're in, Stephen, and then you come to our events in New York and help promote them, which he always does. He always would start on some rant, always against technology. And while most intelligent people find that very funny, I think it's prudent that we all remember a lot of what smart people find humorous is the fact that some illogically completely stupid statement is uttered by somebody who appears to believe it. And this, this broad-based anti-intellectual facade he has is, is an example of it. But in one of my trips, he talks about each of the things that I was asked to come show you. He actually was using an iBot, which I can't show you tonight. And then he goes on to a rant about tech, and you know, as you'll see, that germ of do people really believe this? You know, why don't we teach you know creationism? It's sort of like physics, but, but, <laughs> but. Anyway, I shortened down that one and turned it into something I've used over the years. It's now getting a little dated. But it talks about this stuff, and it should put you in a mood to recognize why we really do need first in every school. So with that, hopefully you'll find this somewhat humorous. But Since that clock is making me very nervous, I'm gonna really scream through a bunch of these things. Um, but yes, we made the first insulin pump, and that doesn't look all that impressive now, but to the kids on the first teams that I was told would be here tonight, I made that in my parents' basement when my older brother was a med student and I was in high school. Um, and those were the good old days. We went on to make other kinds of things. We didn't invent the stent. I wish I could claim we did, but two brilliant cardiologists did. But when they needed the engineering to make it practical and get around tight arches in that corner, we designed and built that generation, and about 100,000 of them went into people. Computer analysis is a powerful thing. Uh, for a company right out here, Baxter, we took that big machine and turned it into the little machine in the middle and the one with the little cassette. We were told in the early days, you're nuts. People aren't going to self-administer essentially life support. Well, it went from indefensible to indispensable pretty quickly, and Baxter, a great company out here, shipped the 600 million therapy for that thing last year, and it's been such a successful product that um, they asked us to design the next generation, which we did. It's even smaller and lighter. They launched it this year. It's, it's quite successful. It's helping a lot of people live a happy life. We're very proud of it, uh, and we won't stop there. Uh, I was asked specifically to talk about this, a prosthetic arm. I also, when I found out that there'd be at least 50 students here from first teams and we give them impossible tasks to do with robotics, once they've tried to do something simple, they'd appreciate what happens when you ask 14 degrees of freedom to all work together in something that will fit in the space of the original equipment, a human arm. But the sad story for this one is we were asked by the Department of Defense, DARPA, to make something better than the hook 
on the end of a stick that we've been giving our veterans since the Civil War when they lost their arm to a musket ball. And when the head of DARPA came to see us and said 150 years has gone by, we don't give them muskets anymore, we give them $100 million machines to protect us, but when an IED takes off one or both of their arms, we don't give them a wooden stick with a hook on it anymore, we give them a plastic stick with a hook on it. He said, I want you to give me something that'll pick up a grape without crushing it. So now he wants efferent, afferent, haptic response, pressure sensing. Or they'll pick up a raisin and not drop. Oh, so he wants fine motor control. Either case, they're gonna pick it up, bring it to their mouth and eat it. That rotate at the wrist, the elbow, abduct and flex at the shoulder. I told him, you're nuts. You've been watching too much Terminator. Um, we ended up calling it the Luke arm. George Lucas didn't mind that because we wanted it to be indistinguishable from the real one. That one certainly doesn't get us there, as you can see it, but in less than a year we built that. They sent us a guy who had lost both of his arms. This is a pretty crude video, but now I'll show you what a guy could do with less than eight hours training on that arm. This is Chuck, and he's gonna punch one of our controls engineers using all degrees of freedom simultaneously. The guy in the back happens to be one of my engineers who's also a Harvard MD trained surgeon. Uh, now they're showing fine motor control, but the best part of this whole movie is when Chuck, in a minute, will go over, pick up a spoon with that hand, take cereal with milk out of that bowl and bring it to his mouth and eat it. And he doesn't drop any milk, which I can't do, but his wife is standing behind me as he does this. And that, you'll notice he has no arms. And she's crying and she says to me, Dean, he hasn't fed himself in 19 years, so you got a choice. We keep that arm or you keep Chuck. <laughs> he now picks up that raisin and that grape and he doesn't drop it and he's very happy. But that's our Model T. That's for the kids that did last year's robot. This is what my kids that did the new model did. Put that picture back. That's way better looking than I am. This is the new version of that arm. We have an FDA approval on it and we're putting them on our young soldiers that need them right now. I hope it'll never be a big market. You saw this, I'm not gonna say more about it except when I was invited down to the White House to get the Medal of Technology. Of course I brought the IBOT, but I also brought that year's first literature and said, Mr. President, as did Bush before you, I've asked you, and since him, by the way, Bush 43 and Obama, I've asked all four presidents, two Republicans, two Democrats, the same thing, please, don't help us. <laughs> Do not turn first into some academic, esoteric, boring thing. I want it to be competing with football, not a science fair. But, Mr. President, the way I get there is I invite the presidents to stand in the Oval Office or the Rose Garden and say to kids once a year, the same way every year you bring the winners of the Super Bowl, the World Series, and the Academy Awards, will you just stand here and say, kids that excel in things that actually matter ought to get the same recognition as these other people. And I'm happy to tell you he agreed to do that. He did that pretty much every year of his presidency, as have the others, including Mr. Obama. And by the way, on the way here tonight, I to read you the note I got from Valerie Jarrett. I said, hey, I'm going to your hometown to talk to the Economic Club. Can I mention that I invited you to be at our kickoff in a few weeks, because you're all gonna be there. You're all invited. And she said, absolutely, Dean, and please tell the crowd there that we are great supporters of your first program. So Valerie says hello to all of you. <laughs> so I can't see what you're at, ah, there you go. So the next version again, the Model T to this, our new partner for this, for those of you, since this is an economic club, we decided no medical products company could really launch this thing properly. So we have a new partner, because after all, it's a mobility device. It's a little company called Toyota and they want to help us make mobility available to everybody. And their ability to scale this compared to wheelchair companies is just mind-boggling. So we're very excited and we'll relaunch it this year. Uh, yes, we made that, and it's funny that we made that out of that medical device, making use of that balancing technology that we spent years developing. And even though 
I spent my life on medical products, including the iBot, which is why. And we did this as kind of a fun weekend thing. It gets launched, and forever I'm the Segway guy. But um, <laughs> we also started working a number of years ago on making a water machine. And with that clock ticking down to eight minutes, I'm going to skip right through this and just tell you that the number one health problem in the world would go away if we just gave people clean water. That black box there, that black box uh, will fill 50 of those little containers, 50 of them, in one day, and it'll take any input water, a cesspool, a latrine, bio burden, cryptosporidia, gerardia, hexphalan, chrome, arsenic, chemical waste site, and turn it into water that meets the US pharmacopoeia standard for water for injection. The problem is how do you get that out around the world? You don't go to your medical partners because medical companies sell in the 50 or 60 or 70 rich countries in the world where people can do two things. Complain about the high cost of medical care and then buy as much of it as they can possibly get because it's the most valuable thing we want. Then there's the other 120 countries in the world that have no access to clean water. But there's no distribution system for high priced medical stuff. But there's one company that gets its product everywhere in the world. That would be these guys. So I went to the Coca-Cola company and said, help me get my water box everywhere in the world and we'll help you make your next generation of a real time, generate any one of your beverages from the mixing and measuring and control technologies that we use in medical stuff, like dialysis machines. We made this machine for Coke. We built about 30,000 of them for their launch under the condition that if we exceed their expectation, their chairman would help us do a trial with those water machines. Their chairman, Mutar Ken, said it's a deal. We exceeded their expectation. He's a man of his word. So at the Olympics, he said, I want to show one of your water machines to the world. I'm the biggest sponsor of the Olympics. Every country will be there. But Dean, could you do one thing for us? What's that, Mr. Kent? You know that black box you made? Yeah. Can you make it red? <laughs> so we did. And there's the chairman of Coke. And we put machines in South Africa, Paraguay, Ghana, we produced hundreds of thousands of liters of pure water, and we proved it can work. Now we got to bring it to scale to show you what that machine looks like before it's painted red. Another guy that said maybe he could help us showed up. That would be Bill Gates. And we said maybe we can help him, and he can help us bring these things to the world. I don't have a lot more time for that, and I'm looking at this clock one down, and I have two videos to show you, which will take almost the six minutes and 15 seconds. So I'm going to skip very quickly through a bunch of slides about first, because the video sort of explains it. The first one does. And the second one explains it. I was asked during the time we were planning this on the phone, Dean, don't just talk about technology, what it is. You have to talk about why you do it. I think why we make arms and why we make iBots is pretty obvious. What first is is a little complicated. But we have a guy that I'm going to play his video that will explain to you what first is. And it's great that he did this video for us. And it's now five years old, so his date is very old. We're much bigger now because we've had 55% compound annual growth for 26 years. But in our first year, we had 23 teams. By the time I met the voice of God, Morgan Freeman, about five or six years ago, he showed up at our championship because I invite anybody I meet. No matter where the conversation starts, it ends with first. And he shows up at the championship, and he's blown away. Dean, what can I do to help you guys? Well, Morgan, since people would listen to every word you said if you were sitting there reading the phone book, you, you might give us a, he said, let me get some video, let me, let me do that for you. And he made the following, which for the last five years we've sent to schools and companies and foundations around the world to help us grow. So here's the voice of God telling you what first is. So that's, that's the voice. That's the voice of God telling you what first is. It's robots. It's now, since I, don't, I want to show you the other one, it's a much shorter one. It's about a minute. Uh, the background, though, to get you there is the fastest flip through 26 years. You saw President Bush 41 say, I'll bring those kids to the White House. Six weeks later in a high school gym, everybody in the world that knew what first is is right there playing with robots that weigh 10 pounds moving tennis balls. Over the next few years, the new president comes in. We keep growing. We move out of Manchester. We move our championship to Disney, which, by the way, I was told that their head of engineering is going to make it tonight, Greg Hale, and he didn't. And one of his 
supporters, UL was invited, and they are huge supporters of first. And with all our stuff going on, we don't have a lot of kids get hurt. Thank you, UL. Seven years later, we have to move out of Disney because they could only build us a, a temporary arena for 30,000 people that year, and they couldn't double again for next year. So we moved to a little place called the Astrodome in Houston. By then, the robots weighed 80 pounds. Then we moved to the home of the 1996 Olympics in Georgia. Then we moved to the 72,000 seat home. Well, this is Bush 43, not known for his passion for tech, but even he, every year, we bring my kids to the White House. And yes, if you chase the President of the United States around the White House with a 100 pound robot, no, the Secret Service has absolutely no sense of humor. <laughs> so then we moved to St. Louis, where our championship has been for many years. Yes, 30% of the kids are women and minorities. Yes, most of you entrepreneurs would like growth like this. We had 50,000 teams that this year. That's not, that's not students, that's schools, different teams. And we have, this data is done by an independent organization who has said, first has the biggest impact of any social program they've ever looked at. That's the Ford Foundation. And this year we now have over 200 universities that have committed $50 million in scholarships, including a bunch right here in Chicago, so thank you. And by the way, you have regional events here in Chicago this coming season. And yes, we're now international. Teams come from all over, including Africa. This is what the map looked like when we put it up last year for where we had teams show up from for the championship in St. Louis. And it's pretty staggering. It's a volunteer organization, 140,000 volunteer mentors, 3,700 corporate sponsors. It's just an incredible program, and you'll all get more out of it than you put into it, and you will put something into it. So you know, the president, he sadly died a few weeks ago of Israel, decided 15 years ago to stop sending teams to the US. He asked me to come and help him build regionals there. Last year, Little Israel had 1,200 teams and they invited teams from Palestine, Jordan. And he made a speech in which he said, if we stop teaching history, which is each group of parents teaching the arbitrary self-inflicted wounds of difference, the political differences, if we'd stop letting every generation of people teach their own history, and start, started for once teaching all kids technology, because it's the same in every language. Math and physics are the same in every language. Maybe we'd grow the first generation of humans that could trust each other, communicate, cooperate, work together, and deal with the same problems they all have. Global warming, food, water, security. And he said first is more likely to solve the world's problem than any political agenda he'd ever seen. I asked him to therefore be the chair of International First. He accepted doing it, said he'd be in Washington on July 17th with me when we announce it from Constitution Hall. And then at 93, he passed away. But this is what was in the letter he sent me when he agreed to do this. This man is the elder statesman of the world, and he said that first is a blessing in its own right, and it'll do more all over the world to make it a better place. This is what his region will look like. I was, in, I was in Beijing. They get it in Beijing. They really get it. This was translated for me at the Chinese Academy of Engineers and Sciences, and it translates to robotics will be the entry point into the third industrial revolution. And unless American kids start getting really comfortable, and I don't mean the elite kids, I mean the next generation of people that want jobs and careers, unless they get started soon, it's over. I was in Mexico yesterday with 4,000 people. They have 500 teams there. This is just to tell you we're getting the rest. I don't have time to tell this whole story. But that leads to, yes, this president brings the kids to the White House. But in order to be ready, in order to be ready for the July 17th launch of International First, I called John Kamen, the guy that did, he's unrelated to me, that great ad when Steve Jobs went back to the nearly bankrupt company and said, you probably, at least the adults in the room will remember this iconic ad they did. They showed it at the Super Bowl, of course. It was the transformation that he was talking about, the big idea. I called John and I said, John, I need a really short video that's understandable to everybody. That first isn't about robots. It's not that robots are just a tool. It's not about robots, John. It's much more important than that. And I got to get everybody behind this quickly. And I'm only going to have a few minutes with heads of state and dignitaries. 
He said, come on down, Dean, you know I'll always help you. I fly down to New York, I spend an hour telling him all the things that he's got. It's not about this. He finally puts down his yellow pad and his pen. It was not an impressive. And he said, let me get this straight, Dean. You want, in about a minute, to take people that know nothing about your robot competition and first explain to them your competition is about robots. It's not about robots. And that it's really important. And it's about kids. Yeah. Yes, John, I, I need that. I desperately need that. And it's got to be impactful. But don't worry, I could get you, I could get you Morgan Freeman. Nobody else could afford him, but he, like everybody else, works for first for free. I'll get you more. And he looks at me and he says, Dean, I think I know what you need. I'll come to the championship. I need to get some video this year. He's just a fantastic guy. He produced Iconoclast. He's Bob Redford and Paul Newman, and they both helped me. He says, I think I know what you need. Give me a week. But I don't need Morgan Freeman. I need a seven-year-old girl. And this is what he sent me. I can't make it any more fun. Everybody that gets involved, whether you do it as a parent, a teacher, a professor, a government person, an industry person, you're going to need these kids more than they need you. If we can get together, that's what makes America great, you know? Give people an audacious goal, but give them the opportunity to cooperate, communicate, like we, these kids are all in this gracious professionalism here. If you get involved, I guarantee you, you, your company, your family, pick your reason. You're a citizen. You're, you will get more out of it than you put into it. It will be fantastic. It will be fun. And it will, it will be likely to change the future of this country and the world. Thanks. Thank you, Dean. I promise to be easier than Stephen Colbert. But, <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I, that I can do. Um, this is a machine to change the world. That was incredibly powerful. Um, I want to ask you just to, to get started a little bit about how did you get started? How did you, at the early time, realize that this was a way to change the world? I'm talking as a kid. So really, the truth is, as a kid, you know that old saying, necessity is the mother of invention? I like to look at the world and always challenge the problem statement. Like in the case of FIRST, everybody said, we have an education crisis in this country. No, we don't. We have great teachers and great schools. We don't have an education problem. We have a culture problem. Kids don't want the education. They'd rather bounce the ball. You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. You can lead a kid to knowledge, but you can't make them think. So as a little kid, I had an older brother who was a brilliant guy, MD, PhD, skipped on to grad school. He's a brilliant guy, professor. I was not so much. And he needed stuff, and I'd build it for him, like those pumps. Well, why did I really get into tech? A, I didn't do well at school, didn't like being told what to do, didn't like being judged by teachers or anybody else. I'd rather do something and let history answer it. People like this or not. But when I finally decided I'm not really going to stay in college, although the best five years of my life, I was a freshman at WPI. But, <laughs> but, but um, I got to a point where I had to tell my parents, I'm just going to start making this stuff full time. And my mother stopped talking to me. You know, she's a teacher. My dad, they had their first sons, the doctor, doctor, doctor. I said, mother, you're one Jewish mother. You got a doctor, doctor. Well, I don't want to leave me alone. But it didn't work. So I realized it's not that necessity is the mother of invention. I realized if this stuff didn't work, my mother would never talk to me. So in my case, it was mother was the necessity of invention. <laughs> and, and it worked. I made a few things. They worked. Then I got a few honorary degrees. So my mom was happy. She got to see me in a silly hat and a robe. And that was it. So parents, you make a difference. I think that's what we're hearing here. That's the bottom line. Yeah, that's the bottom line. One of the things that strikes me about your comment about the ball bouncer and about athletes and heroes and all of that is that it seems that there's an acceptance across all of society that that's important and interesting. We don't all want to grow up to be that basketball player or even think that we can, but we still recognize that as an, of interest. And, and by the way, to be clear, I love sports and they're good for your health and they're good for team. And I have at my house, I have a full size baseball field lighted for night games. For like, mm -hmm. And I have a basketball court and a that's tennis a cool court. House. We love all that stuff. But it's like I love dessert, too. But you better eat your vegetables. And as I recall, baseball has been called the national pastime. 
It shouldn't be the national obsession. And it can't be there instead of the things that create the wealth that allow us to do it. It's there as a reward for that. And we don't make that message very clear to kids. And I have nothing wrong with all kids being great sports fans, but it's nice to see sports people come and cheer for kids that are going to do the things like make them safe machines to fly around and safe ways to drink clean water. You know, it would be nice that if the rest of the world could be as uh, excited about the successes of the kids that work hard to develop this muscle, I think that kind of inspiration would go so far, particularly for women and minorities in this country, to show them where they should put their time and attention. Because in a free country, where kids are free to do whatever they want, including being dumb, in a free country, you get what you celebrate. Let's not blame the teachers if we don't get the kids to celebrate a culture of intelligence and excellence and thought and problem solving, you get the kind of carnival act we saw on the news for the last few months. Yeah. So that, that's exactly where I was going to go. It seems that so often in science and technology, we focus on the you could be a scientist. It's your destiny. We want you to get engaged to be one. Be a fan. What about all? Exactly. That's where I was going. Is what about that building of the fan base and letting people know that it can be celebrated whether you are one or not? You covered that really well. Thank, Thank you for you. that. Um, what does? How does First do that for that fan base? How, I, we saw and we were really motivated by what First does for the participants. Talk to me about the fan base and how does it build a fan base? So I wish I could take credit for this, and I'm hoping that history, as it typically does, tries to draw the simple straight line. They don't have time to show all the stupid things you did wrong. So every success story looks like it was simple, easy, overnight success. Every success I've ever seen is a 10-year. I mean, I think, I think Churchill said it best. I mean, he was facing real problems, right, for a while. And he said, success is defined as being able to go from one failure to the next with undiminished enthusiasm. And, and, and at first, I wish I could say I planned it so beautifully to be modeled after sports. Now, it is true. I did want to model after sports. And I said, it'll be a short, intense season. There won't be quizzes and tests. There'll be just celebrations and trophies and bring the mascots and the school band. I said, sports works so well. I don't, wanna, I don't know why it works so well, but it does. So I'm going to make it a sport in every other way like other sports, and I did. But how do you get the families? I didn't think of that part, except after the second or third year, very, very early on, you'd go to the events. And not only were the kids having a great time, because we made it with the mascots, and there weren't quizzes and tests, and you didn't fail if you didn't get it right. You had a coach who nurtures you, not a teacher who judges you. By the way, it's the same person, so don't blame me. In the classroom, it's the teacher. The same person after school is the coach. They hate him during the day, they love him in the afternoon, playing football. And then. You, we always justify sports in schools by saying, well, Dean, it's critically important. They learn teamwork. Well, if teamwork's all that important, why, when they do it in a classroom, do you call it cheating? But I, I don't know. <laughs> but, 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 but anyway, a long answer to your question, how do you get the family involved? After two or three years of it growing and growing, I noticed that the audience is not only the kids and their parents, but the younger brothers and sisters of these high school kids and the moms never get between a mom and an idea that she thinks could help her little kids. And the moms are saying to me, it's too late. My daughter's 15. It, she dropped out of school. What about a younger brother and sister? Look, they're all here in fan. And literally, the kids are che cheering for their older brothers and sisters. You need Little League. And it suddenly hits me. Yeah, well, sports. You can't have a sport. You just start at 18. In this country, I mean, we don't get kids playing cricket at 18. If you don't start, because we have a you know, World Series, we have college, we have high school, we have varsity and junior varsity. And, inter and finally, we get yeah, the Little League ball. Yeah. Literally, we have T-ball. They're not even capable of moving, right? <laughs> you got to make the ball stand still. and they hit it. But, but they play T-ball, and in their mind, it's baseball. So I said, God, was I stupid. I don't need Little League. I need Lego League. That's it. Mm. So I fly to Berlund. I go find the chairman and CEO of the biggest company in the world that makes engineering creative toys, Lego and said, I got a problem and you got a problem. I got a problem, I got to get down to the younger kids with a simpler kit than the ones that require mentors. And, and you want kids to play with Legos as they get a little older, so let's put some smarts on. So let's work together. I'm going to build, not Little League, but I'm going to build Lego League. But I never really thought of it until it was pushed in my face by a bunch of angry moms. But I adapted to the situation. He keeps pointing at me when he says yeah. stuff like that. Well, you look like you'd be yeah. an angry mom. Uh, my daughter's right there. You can ask her later, later, not okay. now. 
So the long story is, what happened is, just like in every other sport, the kids get involved, then the younger brothers get involved, then the parents go, and then they're proud, and then the kids now graduate, they go off to college, they want to mentor teams, they want to work. And so we've developed the same kind of alumni. Yeah. We have dynasty teams. You know, Motorola in the first few years was a major sponsor, as was Baxter, as was uh, uh, Abbott here. I mean, Chicago was one of the first cities to run its own regional events sure. before the championship. And so you have some of the dynasty teams, and like in every other sport, people, they love those rivalries, and they come back, and they participate in it, and now the colleges are. That's great. So it, it literally developed in the same way other sports do, not surprisingly, because it is a sport. It's not like a sport. It's not a science fair masquerading as a sport. It's a sport. It's just a sport where you happen to be using the only muscle in which you humans compete in the unlimited class. I mean, wow, that football player is really tough. Put an elephant out there. Yeah. Wow, that track star is really fast. Put a gazelle out there. There's only one sport in which we're in the unlimited class. We got a brain that can take an abstract idea, reduce it to a problem that, with an opposed thumb, we can build the tool to solve, and we do that with the tools so of engineering, with an understanding yeah. of science. It's the only sport in which humans would have a prayer, and we don't seem to understand that. That's great. Well, another step in building that fan base might be to have your own cable network or reality TV show, and the next president might be able to help you with that. So make, take advantage of your, of your resources. There's a silver <laughs> yeah, lining. Yeah, that flop, that flop, silver lining and everything. You said something really interesting, which um, I know my own mother had a hard time understanding when I was studying, which is sometimes it takes 10 years before the unbridled enthusiasm of failure before you see the solution. How do you navigate that with DECA? How do you decide what's a failure failure and we're going to stop putting resources into this? How do you decide, give this one a little longer, maybe another decade, and it'll succeed? And how do you know the winners? I was right with you until you added the most insidiously difficult part to that question, <laughs> which is how do you know when to stop? I was with you and you said, well, you fail, and how do you keep going? I was about to say, so I'm gonna say this part anyway, then I'll answer your real question. <laughs> I was about to say, one of the great things about FIRST is what these kids really learn how to do is fail. Right. In school, you're not allowed to fail. Failing is considered bad. You get, but like in sports, they're allowed to fail. They try, most of the time you strike out, most of the, you don't catch the ball, but oh, it was a lucky catch, oh, it was a bad call. In fact, you have to play baseball seven times to see who's the better player. You know, if it was really it's quantitative, you know, you take that math quiz, you don't need to take it again. But there's enough luck in sports that the same teams play the World Series, and they win, then you win, then they win. You have to decide after seven games who's better. I think that's a very important part of sport. Failure is not only accepted, it's tolerated. Right. So in first, we don't give them enough time, we don't give them enough resources, we don't, and we know that. And we tell them, your robot's probably going to surprise you and not do a lot of the things you want, but that's true of everybody else's too, and there's going to be a little bit of luck in this, but who cares? Most of the robots will lose, but you will win. You will learn. You will learn. And then I tell them it's the same way as when we're trying to in make inventing happen. If you want to make your product 2% better than last year and you have a great roadmap, you'll probably do fine. But if you want to start with a clean piece of paper and create a way to have a guy with no legs stand up or make potable water out of a cesspool, or you name it, you're gonna to try to do a lot of great ideas that simply will not work. As long as you learn from them, you're honest with yourself about what happened, and you move on, it's okay. So that's the positive side. But you asked a really horrible question, thank you. Donna asked me to. Well, because <laughs> what you said was, so you fail and you fail and you fail. When, you when do you realize you gotta stop? And to me, that is, I, I don't have a good answer to that question, but I can tell you, if there was some supreme being, whichever one you believe in, God, I don't care, the laws of physics. Morgan Freeman. Morgan Freeman. If you could, if, if, if there was some supreme something, and I wouldn't be greedy. I wouldn't say, after 10 years of struggling with something I can't do, tell me the answer. That would be asking too much besides. Then there'd be no challenge to life. It's only to tell me the answer. You're just, you're, I would just say, I, I don't even want to know the answer. I just want you to whisper. Is there an answer based on the current human knowledge, experience, and available technology? Is there an answer? Because I roll around in bed sometimes thinking, I've been at this one for five years. It's still failing. I should stop. I should redeploy these resources. I've spent millions of dollars. And then I say to myself, you stop now. You lost your vision. You lost your courage. It's still a real problem out there. You've got to solve this. 
you can't give up now. And then I roll around saying, from everything you've learned and everything you did, you're in denial. You're not just a guy with courage. You're a stubborn moron that hasn't learned from your mistake. <laughs> and then the problem is every once in a while, when you are just about to give up, it finally does work. Now, the great news is it finally worked. The bad news is that was very positive reinforcement for being stubborn. The <laughs> next time you have a nearly in <laughs> And so the long answer to your problem, how do you know when to stop? I don't. And sometimes we eventually stop and we think, God, what a waste. I, I butchered myself and tortured myself for years over that one I should have <laughs> learned early. But every once in a while, after lots of smart people told me to stop, you go, really? Here it is. Yeah. So I don't have a good answer, but that's probably what makes life interesting. Yeah, nice. Related to that, um, so often I've been asked throughout my career as a scientist, and you alluded to it, not only alluded to it, mentioned it directly. People say, what good is this for society? You're doing this research, you're doing it. What's the benefit? So you commented that you did all these great medical advancements, and then you're forever the Segway guy, because that's the thing that society longed onto. You wanted to do water purification, and then Coca-Cola had you make it so I can get a seltzer anywhere I want one because of the freestyle machine. So that's a little bit related to this windiest stop, right? It's about the motivation is so often with the public, how is it going to benefit me? And that's not always obvious at the beginning. So how do you answer that question? How's it going to benefit the public? So there's, again, you have, I think you you put together two questions. One is, how does your project in engineering development benefit the public? But you started by saying, what good is this science-based research? Which brings me to, I wasn't there at the time. I'm old, but not that old. But there's a very well-documented story that in the, in the golden age of people finally understanding electricity and magnetism. You know, 100 years before them was the age of Galileo and Newton and F equals MA and three-body problems and mechanics, springs and masses and oscillators. But in the middle of the 1800s, Gauss and Lenz and Faraday, you know, ma magnetism and electricity and electromagnets, and you know, what, what we all live with today, was just starting to be understood. And Faraday, who was a brilliant scientist, I mean, finally, you know, somebody put all the, you know, Ampere's law and Faraday's law, and Gauss's law, they put them all together with Maxwell's equations by which Everything we know about the universe and electricity and magnetism is embedded in those four differential equations. But supposedly... He's reliving my whole entire graduate but, career right now. But, it's flashing but, by me. I okay, love differential equations. <laughs> I can tell. I'm from the holy order of the sacred differential. But anyway, so, so as the story goes, at the Royal Society, there was this huge group of people when Faraday figured out that it's minus DP, that a changing magnetic field across a while will induce... A current as well, but Everybody's a wondering how this helps society, so. Well, here's the famous story. When all the other great leaders of its time at the Royal Society encouraged finally the queen, the queen at the time, to be shown this incredible fact, the way they showed it off was they bring in, you know, a laden journey, they bring in an early battery, this is the middle of the age, and they close a switch and they get a conductor and they had, you know, basically an electromagnet, and close the switch, they see a remote compass, basically, because he was making With the needle pull. And they close the switch, and the queen sees this. And as the story goes, the queen looks at Michael Faraday and says, of what use is this? <laughs> to which his answer was, your highness, of what use is a baby? Mm. Mm, and I really answer. like that answer to anybody any Luddite, anti-intellectual that wants to say of what use is basic scientific research, none. Go back into your cave, rub sticks together, and have a good time. Uh, you know? I can't clap. I have a card. Nice. <laughs> nice. That, that, terrific. I have learned something I will use. That is absolutely terrific. You better credit all the Michael way back. Faraday, not yeah, me. All the way back to Michael Faraday. That's terrific. What, what are the common traits of innovators? You're an innovator, you, do you rub elbows with innovators? Or are you the only one you know that's just like you? What are common traits of people that can shed this roadblock, this ability to say, we shouldn't stop, we should keep going? What other things are common amongst innovators? I think the most common attribute of innovators is actually that they are, a lot of people say they are, but they've been trained 
they've been learned how to avoid failure. School is mostly not to teach you how to think. Mostly it's to give you the experience of what everybody else learned and taught, and the answer's there in the back of the book. And you, so it's a great tool to bring you up to where we are. It's a great way to analyze everything. In fact, that's mostly what classes do. Every problem that has been solved is in that book. The trouble is, people think that's all there is. And the opposite of analysis, which is breaking down everything we know, Newton's law, is synthesis, building things up. But building something that's never been built before is a completely different skill set than analyzing what we have. And I think it's frustrating, and you mostly fail. And I think education is mostly about teaching people how to not fail, even the way we present it. And you get the test, and if you got it wrong, they give you an X, and you feel bad. So if education is about how teaching you not to fail, and inventing is about the only consistent thing about all the inventors I know is we fail most of the time. I'd say the most consistent characteristic I've seen of people that are always out doing crazy new things is that they are willing, as I said, Churchill said it, they are willing to fail, admit they fail, learn from the failure, not blame somebody, else, not, to, not be stubborn, and move on. And you only have to succeed once in a while if it's a big enough problem that you're solving that it gives you the resources and the self-confidence to go try the next one. Yeah. Uh, I think the entrepreneurial spirit today, because we've lowered the barriers so much to trying and we've made the cycle time so much faster and the access to facts so much cheaper, I think one of my great hopes for the reemergence of America in the world isn't that we're gonna find better ways to compete with cheap labor. It's not gonna be all these ridiculous who make jobs. People don't want jobs. A job, by definition, is some boring or dangerous thing that nobody wants to do. That's why they have to pay you. I think a career is what people want. Yeah. And the career is basically creating technologies that eliminate jobs. But not, oh, it's not going to eliminate. Nobody wants to use a shovel and dig ditches. That's why we have bulldozers. Bulldozers didn't eliminate jobs. We could just build whole highways instead of 12 people spending their lifetime building one house. We increase our capacity. So I think that technology especially in a free-thinking culture like America, because we're not disciplined. We're not going to out-discipline the Chinese or the Japanese or the Germans. But if we can harness the intersection of imagination, the impossible, and bring to it the now emerging technologies that are making things much faster and simpler and cheaper to try, America will start creating whole new technologies, whole new industries that won't just create jobs, but they'll create the capacity to solve real problems that create real wealth, and that real wealth will be kept by the, some of the people that make it if we start putting intelligent policies in place on how we run our yeah. lives and our business. Nice. Let's um, use that then to shift a little bit towards the future and solving some of the big problems of the future. What are your thoughts about how innovation and technology and all that that encompasses the intersection of imagination and the impossible will help with something like climate change? So interestingly, I think climate change may be the biggest of the short-term issues, but it's also essentially the easiest to solve. We know many ways to solve it. I mean, we know what's causing it. Do you want to use wind? Do you want to use solar panels? Do you want to use LEDs more? Fit? Do you want to lower demand or increase supply? There are lots of ways that when it gets bad enough, we will just put the appropriate resources at the scale we need to solve that problem. And take care of it. That's very different than your mom just started demonstrating maybe a little dementia. Or you've got a baby that's just, you're told has leukemia. I mean, there are certain problems that we sit and we watch because we don't have the intellectual capacity. We don't have the combination to that lock. And, and I think over the next, I hope even in my lifetime, we're going to see a transformation, for instance, in healthcare and in medicine, that instead of being a method of supplying more and more money to inadequately treat more and more diseases that do nothing more than they don't prolong your life, they prolong your death. Mm -hmm. I think we're going to see transformations like regenerative medicine in which we're going to restore or restore even super restore capabilities to people with low cost, no ongoing chronic treatment because it'll be a cure. It'll be a, Treating a disease is very expensive. Curing it is much less expensive. 
and preventing it is the cheapest. I mean, you could be the invention of the iron lung was predicted in the 20s and 30s. The next wave of polio is going to bankrupt the country. Half the people will be in these iron lungs breathing, and the other half will be taking care of them. And I'm sure all the pinheaded great statisticians that love compound interest and 1.05 to the nth power can bankrupt anybody. Well, they, they all had their plans. Everything was going to wipe, like whatever they're claiming is going to wipe out our healthcare system now is that Alzheimer's can But they probably didn't sit around in the 20s saying, ah, they invented this iron lung. They'll keep people alive forever, but they'll be miserable. They just, yeah, but don't worry. In about 20 years, this guy named Jonas Salk is going to come along. He'll realize that a dead virus, you scratch on your skin, this whole disease state will go away. And today, kids have never heard of polio. Your grandparents were terrified that you'd die of it. Yeah. Kids don't even, it's, it's gone. Yeah. Well, that's got to start happening to every different kind of cancer and dementia and cardiovascular disease and end stage renal failure. And it will, but they'll happen separately. And as they do, the good news is, the cost of taking care of each of those will go down so dramatically. The people that are predicting that and it will look as stupid as the people in the 20s that had neither courage nor imagination. The trouble is, it's the one marketplace that has unbounded, literally unbounded uh, demand. All these economists, yeah, we made food cheap. We had 76% of Americans farming in the 1800s. Now we have 2% farming due to technology. We make so much food. We can't eat it. We can't ship it around the world. We burn it up. We pay people not to make it. We have 2% of the people farming. Nobody cares because you could eat a couple of pounds of food 100 years ago. Every day you could eat a couple of pounds now. So yeah. technology caught up, and we took things that used to take most of our resources and made it a non-event. We did it with food. We did it with housing. We did it with heat. But in healthcare, OK, now you're 70, and we can give you that new knee. So it does not, no, I don't want a new so it does not. I want to go play tennis, and I want to beat my grandson. And I can get rid of that cloud call. I don't want to get rid of it. I want supervision. And I, most people that act like in healthcare technology is, I mean, here's the issue. They treat healthcare like another piece of the economy. But the difference is nobody treats it that way. There's only two kinds of people when it comes to healthcare. If you're feeling healthy, you don't want to pay anything. You're a 23-year-old healthy kid. You don't, uh, whatever the government wants or the insurance, I don't want to pay anything. I'm not interested in that. I want to use my fund coupons for other things. Right. But I don't want to pay anything for health care when I'm healthy, because it's not health care, it's sick care. And then as soon as I'm sick, I don't care what it costs, I want everything you got, yeah. and I want more. Well, that's not a marketplace. That's not an economic model. That's not a financial model. And as the technology gets better and better, that's going to exacerbate itself. So technology has to not only get better, it has to get better so much faster that we can supply all this health care because it's a moral imperative. What if, what if you could have that solution and you'll right. be healthy? We go around the world now, and there are many countries where they simply can't afford dialysis. So a person is diagnosed with end-stage renal failure, and they're told, you're going to be dead soon. In America, they're told, go use this machine. You're going to have a normal life. That's I worse. That. That, that's, so what about when we start getting to that condition with every malady that we now accept? And what if we get to a place where we can use some technologies to treat them but not cure them, or cure them but not prevent them, and it's going to consume more and more of our intellectual, emotional, financial. So I, that's a long way of saying technology is going to be the only answer to these problems, but along the way, it's also going to be the biggest issue in terms of the, the moral, intellectual, uh, societal models of who pays for what, on what basis, and how do we deploy it. Yeah. Nice. I think we just, I think we just, ex ex we just witnessed part of being an innovator, which is I gave you an easy problem like climate change, and you pivoted right to something climate that you said, here's easy. the big problem we need to think about how to prolong life, not make an easier death. So that, that was terrific. Um, one last question um, as we go out on the night. Sorry for leaning into my microphone. Um, what do you wish you invented but didn't? There's only two that matter to oh. me. And I never say never to just about anything. Because I think we will cure. I mean, I, we will put people on, the, you know, on Mars, and I think in Mars. The one, because they're not inventions, they're just iterative 
applications. You know, once we got Newton's laws, a rocket is nothing but a really, really big water bottle. So, so, <laughs> so to me, the real invention that would be as striking as electricity, signals moving faster than a horse. I mean, totally mind-blowing thing, Faraday. The invention that I want, that I'm sadly not going to see, is a time machine, uh, a real time machine. Yeah. I want to go back and talk to Archimedes and Galileo. You know, like, hey, Archie, what's this thing about buoyancy? I mean, I, how did he get that? So, so I'd like a time machine. I won't get that, but the closest thing I've come to a time machine is if the most important thing the world needs is inventions, and it needs it in so many areas to stay ahead of catastrophe, what you really want to invent is a lot of inventors. <laughs> and that's what FIRST does. Yeah. And I think over the next couple of decades, you're going to see kids around the world dramatically change the pace at which invention is keeping us one step away from global catastrophe, whether it's energy, the environment. You know. And I would like to think, I'll be gone, but that invention is like my living time machine. That's beautiful. Thank you. That's beautiful. Thank you. Very good. All right. So thank you again, Dean and Michelle. We really appreciate you being here tonight and for all your remarks. It's been a special night for all of us. Again, if you have the chance before you head out, please check out the first team robotic demos in the front of the ballroom. I wish you all a very happy holiday. The meeting's now adjourned. <laughs>